Well, welcome, Jennifer. I am so happy that you are on my show. We are new friends. Um, I want to let my audience know that I met you actually on Zoom, probably what, maybe a month or month and a half ago for a meeting for Nevada Cancer Coalition. And I became very, very intrigued with what you do for a living. You are very much involved with hospice care and palliative care. And so I reached out to you because I wanted more information on this. It was just so intriguing. And and then we went to lunch. We had a great time. We had a good connection. And so welcome to my podcast. And I am so happy that you're here to share more information with my audience. How are you doing? I'm doing good, thank you, and thanks for having me. I've been I've been really excited about this opportunity um, to talk to um, the, anyone who's listening to your platform and show. Um, obviously, typically it's talking as the show says, test those breasts. So um, obviously, my professional lane is palliative and hospice care, and so I know with us just the brief talkings that we've had, which have been good talks. Um, there's a lot of misconceptions out there in the community and through the country, and so um, thanks for letting me to come on today. I'm excited to kind of share some information. Great. Well, I know that whenever I've heard of the term, especially hospice care, it meant imminent death to me. Like I thought, oh my gosh, they are in hospice care and they are going to like they're the end of their life is like right there. So come to find out that does not really what that necessarily means. And so I would love for you to share what hospice care means, what palliative care means, and sort of try to squash that myth uh, for people who have always thought that as well. Like what are some of the benefits and, and things like that? Sure. Well, there's a lot of confusion within the name itself. Um, palliative is used and intermixed with hospice care. Um, palliative means palliative, meaning that you've got good control of any sign or symptom, whether it be good, bad, or otherwise, you would say that, that, that your nausea has been well palliated with Zofran. So that's in and of it a word. Um, but palliative care overall is looking, and that it, that's a patient that either isn't um, too far progressed in their, in their illness, whether it be uh, severely chronic or terminal, and maybe they're um, getting aggressive treatments for their disease, specific disease process. So that could be someone who's on a palliative program that, uh, and one of the things about palliative is that some are in brick and mortar, um, but really most are a mobile model. I run a mobile model of a palliative care program. So we're able to go directly to wherever the patient's home is and it could be their private home, it could be a skilled facility, um, but we're able to go there and to offer a level of support to the patients, the families, maybe that social services that we can tap into for that patient. Um, and a lot of times it's chaplaincy support um, that they're wanting and accepting of. So a palliative program is, it's not we shouldn't think of it as the primary PCP, but think of it as an additional layer of medical support in the community that is working jointly with the doctors that you are um, still actively seeing for treatment. So that, I think, wraps up palliative care, but there is certainly, you know, a lot of confusion out there. Um, hospice, as you said, a lot of it is, um, there's just a, a really strong feeling about that word, and um, it's, Certainly, my life's mission to kind of destigmatize that word that it is linked to death and dying. It, but on the other hand, it hospices is, is it is what it is, and it's providing that end of life comfort care um, for patients and support to their families. Um, it's it's I've obviously I've been doing this for ten years, and I've been a nurse for a lot longer, but. Um, the ability to bring that specialized hospice medical team into someone's home and preferably before that they are in the last days or weeks of, of their lifespan. It's a wonderful thing to have someone on our program for six, nine, 10, 12 months, sometimes longer. Um, it depends a lot on the individual um, 
terminal diagnosis is, but a lot of people think, well, there's a six month rule and that's inaccurate, but it's something very common um, because at a six month period after being on for use, utilizing your hospice benefit through Medicare, for example, you would have to have a face to face with a physician or with an NP and that would then qualify you to continue on. So the facts are there is no shelf time period for palliative care or for hospice care ever. And um, that's something that I found right away that that people thought that there was a time limit and there's not. It's based on medical eligibility and where each individual is in their their journey and their progress through their either debilitating chronic illness or their terminal diagnosis. Okay. So that makes total sense then, because I've heard people say, oh, you know, my father is on palliative or or hospice care. And I'm thinking to myself, oh my gosh, he's going to die like in a month or whatever, or a week or whatever. And then come to find out they are actually alive, like even a year later, but they were on that care. So that just totally makes sense. Thank you for uh, sharing that. Because yeah, I mean, it's just, Yeah, we have Jimmy Carter, you know, our prior president, Jimmy Carter, down in Georgia, is on hospice care. He's been on for quite a few months now. Um, Those of us in the hospice world and um, that really are passionate about that it's not, again, just about death and dying. It's a choice of, of care and how you receive care. And it's great to bring that specialized care into someone's home, in this case, using our pres- prior president, Jimmy Carter, they're bringing hospice care into his home. And I'm, it's wonderful to read. Um, his grandson has made some um, comments to CNN and saying how they're enjoying their time and that they're happy and they're comfortable. And uh, President Carter and his wife, Rosalyn, who has advanced dementia, that they're together there in the home. And so we've really um, enjoyed as a company Um, to read those. And it's so it's great because that in itself is helpful. Us doing this today hopefully helps someone. I mean, that's our goal um, to say, hey, maybe this, I qualify for this and it's not so scary as it sounds. Um, So yeah. Yeah. That actually brought a little tear to my eye. I think that that is so great about the Carter family. Yeah. I, that's just, uh, I'm just picturing it right now. It just seems to me that It's so much better than being in the hospital and dying and and living out your life in the hospital, you Mm -hmm. know, when you can be at home and getting this care uh, before, you know, I mean, it it just seems that it's a lot more doable and, you know, enjoyable, maybe, if if you will. Um, So palliative care. Would that mean, so like I, when I had cancer, I had a mobile service come to me and give Mm me uh, uh, hydration. Sure. Is that sort of what palliative care is or would I be getting meds from them? How does that, how does that work? Am I misunderstanding that? I don't think you're misunderstanding that. I think that, you know, as far as like a country in different pockets of the United States, we're going to have more aggressive mobile health care than other parts. Um, so I'm very familiar with Phoenix, Las Vegas, and Reno. And if I look at all of those, there's a lot of mobile different services that um, anyone can can tap into um, in Phoenix and certainly in Las Vegas, like the hydration, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so it, it's, it's certainly, it can be absolutely a part of palliative care. And we do do um, consultations and med review extensively and will can report back to an oncologist, for example, because maybe they're using just a straight oxycodone and, and not much with it. And that there's a patient that has extensive metastasis maybe to the bone. And that's where we then refer back and say, Hey, let's try a steroid. Let's try, let's try a long, different long acting, um, and manage that in a, in a little different way. And oncologists are always very open and welcoming to that. Um, and again, the ability to go as a mobile palliative practice to patients home is extremely priceless, um, to be able to bring that there. And it does help with the relationship too, as well as those that are on our palliative program that aren't quite there for a varied reasons to access their hospice benefit 
Um, it does incur it, they get to know us because we, we run palliative teams in all of our markets in Nevada and Arizona. And so those patients that are being on palliative, maybe they're on for a year, year and a half, but at the point if they, unfortunately that they do transition to hospice, they're very comfortable with the team. They mm -hmm. feel they're in good hands. They understand it's a lot of things about palliative and hospice is that just people don't know. They don't know the benefits that, and even, you know, doctors and um, their staff and nurse navigators, and it, and this isn't just from Nevada, but a lot of work I've done down in the Phoenix, um, Arizona market is, is just that they didn't know. Yeah. And, you know, and that's kind of my passion along with a lot of things I do as a nurse and um, in leadership is just to really educate people of what is available. Because I want to know. I want to know and if I am afflicted with cancer and I see a doctor, I want to know everything that I have available to me to support me, my family. How can I be the most successful for this? Is this medication going to make me sick? Um, what, who am I going to call when I'm sick? Um, all those things that I think there are better ways to prepare those patients that are getting that really, really scary um, diagnosis. Right. And I remember when I was diagnosed, I went into my oncologist's office and, and this is very typical across the board of people that I've talked to. You go in there, they give you a big packet, right? I don't even think I looked at that packet. To be honest with you, Jennifer, I was so like crazed out in my mind from the diagnosis and all of the things that I was, had to go through and was thinking about. And I don't even know if any of that information was in that packet. So mm -hmm. I, you know, how do, I'm sure that one of your biggest missions is to make sure that all providers know about the service so that the provider and the, and the patient can make these sort of what, shared decision-making there's these shared decision-making type opportunities, like what is best for this individual and everyone's different. It's not a cookie cutter. Everyone need, has different needs. And so if I was going through something, I would want to know from my providers, hey, there's this service that can come to your home and your insurance will pay for it and things like that. We don't even know sometimes what our insurance will pay for. Um, so how do, what is your conversation that you have with providers to be able to get that information out to patients. And so that patients, it, it, it is guaranteed that patients are going to have this information and have this option for them. Gotcha. Well, it, for, it, it takes a, a great oncologist that's kind of looking at all different sides um, and, and really looking at the patient as, um, not just an individual, but um, looking at their whole structure. So the earlier the discussion happens, the better off that it is for the patients and families. Because again, it's a scary diagnosis. There's a lot going on, just like what you said about the pamphlet. Very, very common, even with hospice and palliative care. Um, so, you know, in a perfect scenario, and when I've talked to different oncology, and one of the really great ones was a pediatric oncologist, and his team had said, you know, Jennifer, it would be so great that these different entities available, medical support in the community that's available, would all stand in a line when a patient and their family come through for their first office visit. And we would shake their hand and introduce ourselves. And this is the specialty that I do and I see. And then that's in a perfect world, you know. Um, but yet, it, it's not that that's undoable. Maybe we won't all be standing in a line. But the more that we educate and talk to physicians and their team members, um, the more that they feel confidence, too, in talking about other, basically, treatment plans. And I know when you and I had talked, and specifically, this is about cancer patients, this podcast and testing the breasts and the importance of that. Um, you know, some people come in and, and they're not that sick, right? They're, they're feeling okay, but they've gotten this diagnosis and they're going to do a, an aggressive treatment plan and it's it's all hands on deck going full force. Great. But what's really nice in that during that first initial period is to have a palliative consult and maybe meet someone like myself or one of my team members to say, I am rooting for you. I, I got you. If anything comes up, call us. Let us know. We're available 24-7 because sometimes, unfortunately, and with treatment, you can get very ill and sick. Your oncologist isn't going to admit you to their office. 
So then that leaves you the only option, which is to go to the emergency department. And I've still to this day, and it's, I've been a nurse for almost 25 years, I've never had anyone ever say to me, this is so great. I love being sick and feeling terrible and going to the emergency room <laughs> and laying on that horrible stretcher, <laughs> bright lights, like in a note and you're like pushing the button and you feel terrible mm-hmm. and it takes forever. Like being involved with a mobile palliative company that's going to alleviate some of that. You're going to have that ability and that relationship building with a different medical community-based entity that will be able to to help you on. And if that does happen, of course, our hope and goal is that it doesn't happen. Many people have treatment and they're like, "Hey, I didn't suffer so much from the known side effects that could happen. I'm doing pretty good." So that's great. And we keep in touch with them. Maybe once a month we check in. But again, it's really dependent on where the treatment how it's going and what are the debilitating negative effects that are happening. Um, Sometimes patients, you know, again, diagnosed with a terminal um, cancer and it's been going on for a while and they didn't know that it had any signs or symptoms and they're already a stage four. Um, We do see that. That can definitely come in as a palliative consult, but in reading the medical records, that's also cluing us in that we may have a transition sooner than later to hospice. And we want to open up that really tough conversation with patients, their families, and sometimes even their their oncologist and and care team model because it's hard. It's really hard to say and to bring up and talk about end of life and the plans that need to be made. And it's a part of our culture and our country. And, um, you know, I love to use my family for examples. Um, I call them my aunties. And um, I've got uh, lots of aunts, but these are the two aunties. And um, they they don't believe, they don't get it. And I'm thinking, I, you know me, you know what I do, but still they can't get around of what the benefit offers. And um, and so I think I always use that to say it's it's hard and it's even hard for me. I, I'm, of course, here the expert, apparently, you know, and I think I know a lot, but still it, it's a challenge to talk to people and, and to broach those subjects of end of life and preparation, but yet so, so important because really, you know, getting the aggressive treatment, the cancer diagnosis, you're on plan A and to do everything you can to get things in remission and to feeling good again and moving past this. And then, of course, those that, that aren't as fortunate, you have to, it's the, to know there's a plan B in place and what it is going to look like. I've seen over and over again, give people such great peace and confidence that that transition plans available when, when the patient's ready. Yeah. Well, I would imagine that would be very difficult. And I guess, you know, when it all comes down to it, Jennifer, you're a human being and you've got feelings and, and even though you are the professional and you are the one that has to tell these people and help them through, um, you know, you're a human being and it makes sense Mm -hmm. that that would be that might be a little emotional for you and you probably get close to people and lose people and see people move on and live their lives, you know, and things like that. But, um, yeah, I think that it would be a great idea to have everyone come together and introduce and so that people have an understanding of what their options are, because I don't even, I was in the hospital quite a bit um, during my cancer treatment because of uh, dehydration or um, low blood, like I had low hemoglobin and I had to have a lot of blood transfusions. And so I spent a ton of time. And because a lot of the times that when I did not feel well, when something was going wrong, it was after hours. Mm -hmm. So I would call and talk to the after hours uh, doctor that was on call. And then, you know, there were a lot of times where I was told, go to emergency. (laughs) So knowing that this, this is out there, you know, I wish I would have known. And and again, that is why I have this podcast is to make sure that I get these resources out to people, you know? So, okay. So what do people need to know about commercial insurance coverage for beneficiaries with a cancer diagnosis? So thank you for bringing that up. I was waiting, waiting for that to come on to this. So, um, So commercial carriers, nearly all of them have a benefit carved into them for hospice. Um, And that is something that, again, having an aggressive oncologist that is aggressively treating you, but also saying and knowing 
this is going to be a struggle. This may be this male or female's fourth, fifth, ninth, tenth line of chemo. I've had patients in twelfth line of chemo before. Um, have been fighting for over a decade, you know, to keep and keep this cancer at bay and, and get it in remission, and they've done it over a period of time. But what that benefit is, and say their uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield, like. For yourself, like for your example, how you you, know, you felt badly and you used to go to the emergency room, you could be getting the aggressive treatment that you were doing with your oncologist. You could also access your hospice benefit through your commercial carrier um, and get that full support 24-7 in your home, bringing in those obviously fluid tra you know, transfusions you were talking about. We can't do blood at home, but what we can do is help for transport for you to get to an outpatient clinic. We're working with that clinic. We're updating your oncologist. We're doing these things. We're doing advanced pain management, symptom management. We're, we're really, really good at that. And one of the things that make us so good is that is because we can go there every day if needed, even multiple times a day. It just depends. It's a very individualized plan of care. And what the facts are is when the, this does happen for a commercially insured patient fighting for their lives and for, um, for remission is that they live better, they live longer, their, uh, their pain is managed um, they're able to spend that quality time with their family, and they have that ability to continue to assess what their goals are. And what we do as a hospice company for a commercially uh, benefited um, cancer patient that's getting treatment is we're aligning our goals with them. Like, what are your goals? My goal is to beat this cancer and for it to be gone and banished once and for all. We're like, okay, we're with you. What's your other goal? What's important to you? A lot of times I've heard from women, I want to be able to get my kids to school. I want to be able to make dinner. I'm mm -hmm. exhausted. I have the side effects from classic opioids. So it's those things that we do when we bring in and we're like, okay, guess what? We can use different medications. And sometimes their mechanism is different, but it's it's much better for pain control um, and get those started and monitor those long-term care medic medications that sometimes oncologists are kind of scared to prescribe because it's difficult for them to follow. They're not going to, they don't have the ability to come to your house at two in the morning or eight in the morning or all those, those things that are needed. So, um, you know, it's something that we, I first initially carved out in the Phoenix market. It's been almost 10 years now. And I know it's talking with yourself, Jamie and Amy and other team members in Nevada have been like, I've never heard, you know, what is this? And so, um, yeah, I'm on, thanks for again for having me on because the more we talk and the more we reach out to people and that those for myself, you know, with my insurance is GIA. I, if I have cancer and it's um, not, you know, I want to go, I want to ask my oncologist, look at my benefits or call my insurance, say what benefits are afforded to me? What, what help and support can I have while I'm doing this huge battle for my life? So, yeah, um, I just keep thinking in my head, there are, I could have used some of the services mm -hmm. during my journey and I'm really hoping that people are listening to this and understand that they need to be able to access those resources. And I'm glad that you're talking to C Cancer Community Clubhouse. <laughs> I know those two organizations, Cancer Community uh, Clubhouse with Natalie Stevenson, and making sure that people there know what their options are as well. So um, yeah. you come from a line of veterans. <laughs> so they're very near and dear to your heart. And so, and Infinity has some really great benefits for veterans. What veteran support and benefits are there for, for themselves and their spouses? So usually there's, there's, there's quite a bit, you know, and it depends on the veteran, depends on their, um, their, their service and, um, their, um, if maybe if some uh, veterans like my my husband and uh, son-in-law have some disability attached to their years of service, so that changes uh, what what benefits are afforded to the veteran. Of course, even the spouse. If your spouse was a veteran and has passed away, you have the ability to access um, your spouse's um, veteran um, benefits. So one that's that's really important is called um, time and attendance, and that is private duty care support coming into your home every day. 
pay. Um, the Veterans Administration pays for it. That's millions upon millions of dollars that are stacked in there for veterans and their spouses to access. So with us and our programs all being a level five, which is the highest level you can attain within the We Honor Veterans organization, we have not only on staff veterans that um, are working for us, but we also have connections with veteran service officers who are typically referred to as VSOs. Um, we're able to access and get your DD-214, whether it be for your spouse that's no longer with us or if it you, is for the veteran themselves, they typically know where that paperwork is. But things get lost over time. You know, a lot of uh, veterans that we're seeing now are the Vietnam era. They didn't want to hold on to things that attached them to that really terrible time in history. Um, and, and we've done some amazing work with those with those veterans. You know, we still have some Korean veterans and we always again um, are asking and that's a part of our our what we do for palliative and hospice is to screen for um, if there is anyone in the family that is a veteran and who and to make sure that we're we're doing the recognition as as needed um, we it's not even have to be on our census or getting treatment we partner all over with even I know in Phoenix we do a couple of the transfusion rooms where we go in and they'll let us know veterans are there and we'll go in and do um, do a, an award and just a recognition and say thank you shake their hand and again a lot of them are Vietnam veterans so they really you think I think in our minds we think oh people are get telling them thanks and I don't need to, and I feel funny about it. And it's like, no. And then that's what I love about our programs is how we've all been so energized to be so engaged because we've gotten and accessed the knowledge and education to give us that confidence for veterans and different branches of service that each individual has served for, served with. Um, and, you know, they serve for all of us. And so it's a great opportunity to be able to give back to the veteran and to access benefits. And, fact is, and which is really mind-boggling, is that 70% of VA veteran benefits are left on the table. Yeah. Veterans and their spouses are not accessing them. Um, so again, another level of things that I'm passionate about, I want to know. Again, I want to know what my husband has afforded to him as a veteran, 30 years, two war, two combat tours that he did. Um, and that, you know, what, what will the VA cover and what will our commercial insurance, and maybe we're Medicare by that time and he's sick, I want to see, well, what can I get covered through the VA and so that maybe he's dual benefited and can get aggressive treatment at 70 years old and get palliative hospice care. So those are the things that, you know, we're always talking about and, and getting out to um, anyone that'll listen to us because it's what it takes. Well, I'm really glad that you actually talked to veterans about that because, um, yes, 70%. And we found that out probably within the last, say, maybe four years. My husband was in the 82nd Airborne, and mm -hmm. he has uh, friends who served with him. And they all, there were some of them, some of them who have never gotten their benefits and some of them are mm -hmm. like, you need to go get your benefits. Like yeah. these are the year for you. And it's amazing how many say, nah, 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 that guy lost a leg over there. I didn't lose the leg. He deserves it more than I yeah. do. And the fact is, is that I don't think it's a pie. I don't think <laughs> like <laughs> if, if you go get your benefits, it's not taking away from the guy who lost his leg. Right. So Exactly. And I think they've got in their mind this guilt thing like, hey, you know what? I served my country and I and I don't they even want to think about that anymore and whatever. Yeah, that was yeah. totally our situation. So we now know uh, what benefits are out there. So I know now that if my husband got cancer, this service would be great for him, it's, you know, and 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 hopefully, you know, people around the country can know what services are afforded to them in yeah. their area. Cause I know you guys are yeah, Arizona and Nevada specifically. Right. Cool. Yeah. And you know, we're seeing more and again, you know, the Vietnam um, era population is, is a, it's that a, upon us. They're, they're well into their seventies and um, it's been, it, it's so rewarding, you know, I mean, that they they definitely want to have that recognition. It's been some of the best memories that I'll carry with me in my life. 
Um, you you couldn't have said it better as far as um, veterans not getting registered and accessing their benefits, thinking that some had it much worse than they had it. And, you know, our son, my son, he's just now getting involved and getting registered in the VA system. He's been out of the service for over 11 years. And um, he went in right away at 18, and he was an infantryman. And um, I'm very, very, very proud of him. He's my inspiration on many, many levels. Um, and, um, cause he served and he, he didn't complain and he just was there and he was a whiz with weapons, but he said he never had discharged his weapons. Sometimes I'm not sure about that right now, but you know, cause then that's very common too, is where people will come home in their service and they say, it was okay. I'm okay. I'm good. But it takes him a while. And so it's taken him 11 years and he's like, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I, I'm, I don't think I'm okay. I need to talk to somebody. And so again, I'm so proud of him and um, to, to get that help. And it's so much, we, we never know what a veteran's path was. And, and I'm always um, so want to hear the story, you know, because I just love people. I love their stories. And, you know, to find out what, what brought them to that crossroads and to sign their name, you know, on that list to the government, you know, it's a blank check, you know, it's yeah. really, yeah. So, well, that's the whole point. That was the whole point we were trying to make with my husband because he was one of those that didn't access it for years. Right. And I, uh, you know, he jumped out of an airplane, out of he out of an airplane a, a ton, a million times. I don't even know yeah. how many times right. where it damaged his hips. He has two artificial hips now. He's got sciatica. He's got a lot of stuff going on with right. his body, and and this was all you know, um, related to that. So right. yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thank you for sharing that. I appreciate that. I think it's so important. And I will say that, um, as a spouse of a veteran, I was just approved for champ VA right. and I didn't even know that even existed. <laughs> and so when I go get my breast surgery, my second phase breast surgery, the revision to the mastectomy and reconstruction in new Orleans, Mm -hmm. They take Champ VA. And awesome. so I my benefits with that totally tr you know outweigh um Medicare. I mean not Medicare, right. um Blue Cross Blue Shield. Right. It's yes. I mean it, it is really, really that dramatic. So yeah. I'm like so thank hence, you. hence the importance of doing that screening <laughs> of veteran if they're a veteran in, in involved, if it's just the patient themselves or if it's a spouse of a deceased patient. I had my sister-in-law recently, I'm sharing this because it was just, it was so too, it was too cute. And she was looking for help and guidance for her good friend who lives in Illinois for her mother. And I said, was her dad a veteran? And my sister-in-law said, no, he was an accountant. <laughs> I said, okay, great. But ask the question. So a couple yeah. hours later, she comes back. She says, yes, he was a veteran. He served in Korea. I said, okay, now let's talk about the VA. So, you know, it's funny how, you know, um, she said, well, no, he's not, he wasn't a veteran. He was an accountant. But, <laughs> but what was he doing in the fifties? We need to look and see and ask, were you possibly in Korea? You know, cause that was a big, a bit, there's a large, that was a large, you know, activation and deployment of, um, our men and women during that, that period of time. So. Right. Yeah. yeah. And it takes someone like you and me to ask those questions yeah. and, you know, kind of jog their memory a little. And right. Yeah. So we talked a little bit about um, medication and advanced medication. Do you have anything else to say about that? What kind of management support there is at home as far as advanced medication? Yeah, I think for when I think of that as advancement, I'm thinking of, you know, especially if um, an individual has a port, you know, we can if they're in a pain crisis, the ability for us to access that port is a beautiful thing. We're able to get those um, those medications that you wouldn't typically see in the hospital. I mean, we can get them, manage them and they actually stay in the home so that they're there before, preferably before they're needed, because again, to be the most success is to have the tools in place. And so that's something that we're always looking at as well. Um, so at the ability to access the port at home and to quickly get medications in via that port is, is wonderful. Um, if a patient doesn't have a port, there's other ways that we can access medications. We use some sub Q catheters, which are super effective because maybe people are tired of being, um, having 
in their port is not accessible maybe for some reason or another. So again, that is another option. Um, the ability to safely use long-term opioid um, controlled uh, medications is, is helpful. Um, we hear a lot about fentanyl in our news uh, media, and but on the medical side, the facts are it's extremely, extremely effective. It's used in all different types of different scenarios, um, always used in the operating room typically, um, because it's just great. Um, opioid anti is just great. It works great, blocks pain. We can use that in transdermal patch. Sometimes that's very effective for our cancer patients, but then also there's a medication called methadone, which is extremely, extremely effective, sometimes more so than any classic opioid. Um, for one, it controls the pain really well, um, especially generalized pain, even bone pain um, and visceral pain. It's just, it works really well, but it's also can be very dangerous. The danger part of methadone is the way that it acts in all medications of having a half-life and a short life is what we call. So methadone mm -hmm. takes a while to build up in the system and hence needs that observation from a trained clinician, a registered nurse, a nurse practitioner, um, one of our MDs. You know, we're, we're all very highly involved in that we're building up this interdisciplinary group of medical professionals to manage that medication. But methadone has, it's really, it's a game changer for um, I always think of women because we're always busy and want to do stuff. And a lot of times we're obviously when they are suffering from cancer, their classic opioids are being used. And those common side effects are the drowsiness and the sleeping and <laughs> extensive constipation and things that get us in the hospital. Methadone can totally change and flip that, flip that picture where they don't have the constipation. They don't have, it doesn't give you that feeling of a high or, um, and I don't mean that in any negative way whatsoever, but it, it, you, obviously it takes a little bit, 48 to 72 hours to build up to the full potential because that's how long the half-life is for methadone. Um, but what we find over and over again, and in which I love is that, you know, women that I've had the honor to be their nurse and to look at their medications that they're on and to give them education and the opportunity of trying something different. And they, they're all up for trying something different because they want to have pain control and they want to be as mobile and move, move, move as much as possible. And then to be able to say, I got, I got my son to school because again, the methadone doesn't have those classic side effects where you couldn't operate a car um, or you couldn't do a class or you couldn't go out to dinner. You know, when you're we're in pain and we're struggling and we're nauseous and we feel good, we don't, it's, that's just. How are they living? You know, it's like so, such a struggle. And again, that's why I'm so passionate about getting the education out there for commercial benefited patients um, and even for Medicare patients, because this isn't just affecting us. It's affecting our whole government. And the facts are, is that keeping people, people, people humans um, out of the hospital for and keeping them in home in the right level of community care saves a lot, a lot of money. More important than that is the patient satisfaction, is that it goes through the roof. When you have a, a really a good, well-rounded mobile medical practice coming in and doing a plan of care for you as a patient and supporting your family while you're still able to, whether you're getting treatment or not, it is really a great, great benefit. It's The hospice benefit for Medicare is the largest medical benefit of the United States government. Um, and the fact that we pay for it our whole lives and, and if, and, and we don't know a lot about it. So. Yeah, that is very true. I mean, you're telling me things that I, I, I'm, my mind is blown. How, you know, thinking about all these things that you, your company does and other companies, how many people are in our area that work for infinity? Like, how do you, how does that work? Like if I needed, for example, if I needed somebody to come to my house right now, they would be there, there in an hour. Okay. They'd be okay. there in an hour. So, so I'm really proud of that. Thank you for asking that. So, you know, we have staff uh, obviously here in Reno for palliative and for hospice. We have um, three NPs, nurse practitioners. We have two physicians. Both of those are MDs. Um, we have um, 10 nurses. And then on top of those nurses, um, you have myself here. I'm not here all the time, but I'm still a registered nurse and I legit go out and touch people out in Reno because it helps fill my well. 
Um, we have clinical leadership that are registered nurses as well. We've got um, LPNs. We have CNAs that are the backbone of what we do. They do that incredibly important, like intimate care that sometimes it's a struggle for us if we're not feeling well or can't breathe well, you know, we still want to be clean. Um, so, and of course, then the chaplain social workers, our volunteer program, our veteran support. So, um, that, that is all of, we, we hold ourselves to extremely high standards and from referral to connection to admission, to, whether it be palliative or hospice, we have a four hour time limit that we put on ourselves. And that's not for during the day at 2 p.m., that's at 2 a.m. in the morning. So if we get a call from a palliative patient in the middle of the night and things are going really badly, we're able to organize and put a medical team together to go out to that patient's home and do an assessment talk with them because maybe they were maybe they were at the end of their treatment plan and they knew that it the end that they couldn't take it much more to have someone to call at two in the morning to come out and immediately start setting things up for them and get them comfortable um, is amazing versus going to one of the area emergency rooms who don't know you and may or may not know your oncologist and cardiologist and pulmonologist. I mean, I could go on and on. And they, you go through the whole room roll because at, in, in their defense at the hospital, you're coming there for help. So they're like, okay, we want to help you, but I need to dig in and do this and check your blood because I don't know you. You know. So then there comes the, that time before you know it, you're there for 12 hours and you just really needed some um, something stronger than Zofran. You know, I'm um, thinking back, I went to the hospital emergency, I would say four times um, because I was so uh, exhausted and it was because my hemoglobin was so low. I had one doctor, emergency room doctor, who actually took the time to really learn about me and read. He was so interested in my mm -hmm. story and what I was going through that he came in there numerous times to really get what was going on straight. And right. he, it, it made me feel so much better because really you are just a number in there, honestly, you know, and he they're really nice. Difference. He, he made did. a difference in your life for the rest of your life. You will always Hundred. remember how that made you feel. Yeah, 100%. And I actually went online. I was so impressed and so yeah. touched by his ability to do that, his human nature, that I went online and, and put a review on there. I said, this doctor is rock solid, like he cares and he yeah. wanted to do what was best for me. And he kept on looking at my records, looking at all everything. Mm -hmm. And it was just, and he's the one that said, you shouldn't be an emergency. This is what should be happening. And I'm just like, okay. So I was blown away. Yeah. Um, I want to remind my audience, uh, just to kind of interject here and remind my audience and go back to something that you said that really stuck out in my mind. I love the fact that you all sit down with the patient and come up with a plan together. And by asking them what their needs are, like what is concerning you? What are your goals? I love that you do that because that does not happen every single day of our lives when we are dealing with something like this. Mm -hmm. And so just the just knowing that there is a service out there like infinity to be able to sit down and actually be a human being and treat these people like human beings and asking them those questions. I want my audience to understand that what this means and what they have access to and what they really need to keep in mind if they ever need something like this. So thank you really truly for saying that. And that, that just, that gave me goosebumps in a really good way. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and it's, this, it, we think in our minds that, it, that what you just said would be so easy, right? Like, okay, I'm Jennifer, I'm a nurse and I'm going to Jamie's house. I've never met her. I don't know where she lives. I don't know what's important to her. I don't know her religious background, her belief system, how she culturally, how her family operates. There's all these unknowns. And we go out to people's homes. And I love that because it certainly it takes confidence on our end, but we certainly do a lot of training um, to be able to open exactly what you said, to open up that dialogue and to say, you know, what keeps you up at night? Like, 
Yeah. A lot of times people, they cover, they cover well. And if their spouse is there, sometimes even their children, it's hard to find out. And really the thing is, is what is important to you, the patient, what do you want? Because for me, and I always say to all of my teams and who all that I work with to say, it's find out what they want. People should get what they, what yeah. they want, you know, and need kind of, you have to look between the two. Do, is it really needed or, you know, do you just want it? Um, it's so it's different things. And again, that the support of the family is huge because so many times there's been, and they're usually an older, um, person that has really just struggled and struggled and struggled. And you ask them, you know, how are things going? And they like, it's terrible. I hate this. I don't want to go, but they go for their kids or they go for their husband. And sometimes just even that it kind of opens the dialogue and the tears start flowing with the family and saying, well, I don't want you to be sick. And, you know, it's almost like getting them to say that it's okay, you know, cause it has to be okay, but yeah, it's a lot. We, we do so many things. And again, it's just, um, it's not really doing a job. It's, it's that old saying, you know, do what you love and you'll never work a day. I mean, going in and being able to talk to patients and their families and making a difference. And, you know, as you said earlier, you can imagine how close that, that's something that we can get to people. I know I shared some stuff with you at lunch and, you know, I carry those patients with me every day of my life. And, um, I'm so honored to have been able to help them and know them and, and to make a difference that their days were good. And when they were having a, a bad day, meaning pain or some negative sign symptom, I was able to get over there and get meds out, delivered to their house. To me, it was magical, just magical to be able to well, work that fast. That's great. Um, I, I want to wrap this up by saying that reiterating to my audience that advocating for yourself is so, so important, um, asking questions. But I also like that you all ask questions that they may never have thought about, or they felt guilty about asking or whatever it is, because we never know when there's a strong personality like me saying, Hey, you know, and asking questions and, and trying to get to what I can access to make my life better during this time. And then you have your people who are super, super, you know, very private and yeah, sometimes a little meek and not asking these questions. So you all have these questions in place that you can ask them to, to, to help them understand that this is something that you can use. This is something that will help you. So that's great. I think that's yeah. great. Yeah. Is there anything else you would like to share before we wrap up? Because I know that you have a meeting to get to. <laughs> and so, yeah, if, yeah. Well, thanks. Thank you for having me. Um, I hope to come back again and to reach out. We're certainly uh, pushing forward through primarily the state of Nevada, um, where you reside up there um, in northern um, Nevada. So we're very passionate about the education and to talking um, to any of the oncology groups and patients and um this, we're excited, you know, because we've seen how it made such a difference in our Phoenix market um, and really caught on. And so we're really pushing to do that here in Nevada so that people know um, humans, uh, beings, that they're treated as such, not just a number, and um, that they're heard and listened to and what's important and then getting that for them. Great. Well, I'm grateful for that. And I just appreciate your taking the time and helping us all understand. And yes, if we can come back on the show and talk about other things, that would be great. And thank you, Jennifer. I hope the rest of your day is amazing, just like the person that you are. And I'm so glad to know you and to, to my guests. And, you know, thank you for listening to this episode of Test Those Breasts. And we will see you next time. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye.